excited for today's interview. Today, I get to interview my writing coach, most specifically a fiction coach or my fable coach, Leslie Hinson. Did I say that right, Leslie? You did. All right. At least I can read a little bit. (laughs) So I got a chance to get introduced to you by another author that worked for Scribe when they were fully in effect. And um, that, that author was, that writer was not available to be able to assist me in my next book. And you were, and it was so amazing because I was, let's use a couple of our quotes. The mind can only see, the eyes can only see what the mind is looking for, right? And I was looking for somebody to help me write fables and you happen to have some sort of degree in fable writing. Is that right? <laughs> well, I have an MFA in fiction. I'm not sure if they do degrees in fable writing, although I do know someone who did her fiction with um, a folklore emphasis, which is pretty cool. But I had in my community of book coaches, they know that I'm a fiction person. So I think that's why when you were talking about your project, my name came to Madison's mind. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. So why would a person want to have an MFA in fiction? Does that mean you just want to get a master's degree in writing fiction? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, you're not wrong. Actually, the reason why I wanted to get an MFA is because I could teach. So we do, you don't have to have an MFA to teach at a university level. One of my favorite professors actually doesn't have an MFA, but he was my thesis advisor. So you don't have to have the MFA, but it really helps your resume. It also just helps, you know, your ability to teach because you're able to interact with these professors and take their classes for several years. Um, So that was the main drive for me to get the MFA. I love teaching. I'm not sure if that's actually how I want my life to go at this point, but I'd like to have the ability in the future. And I also just wanted to get better at the craft. It was three years of pretty intense learning and writing and being revised and learning how to revise other people's work. So that's why people get an MFA for the most part. Got it. And your undergrad is in fiction writing also? My undergrad is in French. And I actually have two undergraduate degrees. One is in French language and the other one is in directing, which is very interesting. I never, my parents were aghast when I said I was going to study directing for the stage. But I actually think of book coaching and editing as directing a book. And so kind of the, the overlap is I think of these big projects with so many moving pieces as like a Rube Goldberg machine that like one thing sets off another thing and you have to be able to hold this huge container of a project in your mind at the same time. And it actually translates really well from directing a play to directing a project. Hmm. that happens to be a book whether that's fiction nonfiction, or or what that's awesome well I know I have appreciated the journey and it's been amazing for me I believe I was sharing with you I was listening to a podcast that talked about an author and the the word author comes or is a derivative of authority yes on a particular subject yes so I I we were talking about the word, some people say, oh, you have a ghostwriter. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, I have a book coach. And mm-hmm. I don't think people really understand the difference between them or if there is any difference whatsoever. Yeah. And it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because later that day after our call, I went and taught a ghostwriting class for uh, a nonprofit here in Nashville. And I, one of the big things I talked about is like, what is a ghostwriter and what is a ghostwriter not? And I brought that up that you had said that because ghostwriters never feel that our work is, that, that we're giving the work to the author. The author really is the author of the work. We would have never had these ideas without the author. And I love that you brought that up because I'm a, an etymo- etymology nerd. And so just the fact that you shared that with me, I was like, the author is the authority. That's where the word comes from. And I was like, that's perfect. And there are a few different definitions between ghostwriter and book coach. For the most part, people say ghostwriters actually put the words on the page and the book coach doesn't. But I think that 
a lot of projects kind of have a little bit of both. And it at the end of the project, the person whose fingers actually typed the final sentence isn't really as important as how the collaboration went to get to the final sentence, if that makes sense. So, I mean, some people would have a pretty strict definition of it. And I think I kind of don't. It just depends really on the project and, and the author. Yeah. And, and, and so, and I appreciate that very much because I have a lot of original ideas. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> you have great ideas. And I think it was Peter Diamandis had said, you can't write a short enough book mm -hmm. and the more stories, the better. So yes. going through a fable focused type of exercise was really helpful for me and the people I've shared our stories with, and I'll call them ours. Oh, absolutely. You added a lot to the stories are like, wow, I'll remember this. Mm -hmm. I feel the same. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them are, are, are incredible lessons and tools for people to be able to remember a particular type of message that's going across. Some are cautionary tales, right? We had that mm -hmm. and then we had historical tales. And what I loved about it, what do we call it? Some true, some not some so, not so true. true. Where yeah. did you where did you hear that before? You heard that? Well, before. I think that was inspired by the the Hulu series The Great, which is a retelling of Catherine the Great, and it says an occasionally true story. So they, they have yeah, they have the time period rooted in truth. They have some of the bigger accomplishments of Catherine the Great's reign as truths, but the the day-to-day -day interaction she has with people are completely made up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I thought that was fun. That was actually a license to create anything exactly. I wanted, right? I didn't have right. to be exactly correct. Right. And we took these truths with, for instance, the the root of the word mesmerize that people use all the time in modern day English is actually a man's last name. And that's true, but we took that idea and, and created a whole story around it that could be a cautionary tale that isn't actually what happened to Franz Mesmer as we exactly. found out upon researching him. Yeah, so and that was part of it. And I love that we got to do some research on it. You came back, I came back, I was like, oh my gosh, did you see this? Or, oh my gosh, did you see that? So you seem to enjoy this process as well. Oh, it's so much fun. <laughs> I've had such a good time. And I've learned so much from this project, not just the historical things about, you know, researching tulip mania, researching Franz Mesmer, researching Columbus. I didn't realize how many times Columbus got turned down before someone said yes. Um, but these are things that, like you said, people are going to think about them Anytime they hear these words, anytime I hear someone use the word mesmerize, I'm going to think of our Franz. There you go. You yeah. Know? Anytime sure. I see a porta potty, I'm thinking, hey, that contractor really knows what they're doing. Yeah. Otherwise, they're pissing in the bushes, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, what are some of your takeaways that you've learned through the time? Because I know you had mentioned some of them when we were talking. Mm, that's a great question. I mean, every one of the stories I learned something from. I think, you know, my favorite one to work on was It's a Wonderful Drive, because in researching for that, I got to watch Iron Man and It's a Wonderful Life. So that was pretty fun. Go. I watched them back to back. Uh, very different films, but they kind of go together in a nice way. And then getting to weave them together into a story that has um, the moral we wanted to convey was a really interesting and fun exercise. And I think that that takeaway is you know you have an idea of what you want to see in the future but you might not know exactly how you're going to get there mm. and in theater they used to tell us move confidently in the direction of your dreams I don't remember who said that but in moments when you don't have that confidence how can you still look to your end goal and use that to inspire you to to keep going mm. and I think that was a great takeaway because there are so many years that I didn't think I was going to be a professional writer. And I just knew that was the end goal. Not that I've, I'm at my end goal. I'm not entirely sure what the end goal actually is for me, but the fact that I'm a working writer and, and helping people write books, amazing. I never thought I would get here at certain points and then here I am. So 
I feel like it's a wonderful drive. I'm not sure if, you know, if I were in this fantastical version of the story then and somebody was showing me like, oh, here's the future that you didn't become a writer, that it would be, you know, a catastrophic event like it was for our character. But I think I'm a lot happier doing this than I would be doing anything else. I would have to 100% agree with that because you shared with me that you have a friend in town Mm -hmm. and you were disappointed because you couldn't be working (laughs) because you enjoy doing it so much. Yes, I, I really do enjoy this work. And luckily I got to have the best of both worlds because I got to see her for the whole afternoon and then she went and did went to a concert and and then I was looking at the project again it's the satisfaction of fit- finishing a project is pretty strong mm. mm-hmm. I wonder what your strengths on the strength finder spectrums would be because mm. you would be somebody that's absolutely detail oriented and very responsible I'm sure you don't live an entrepreneurial life to the most part it, that's interesting that you say that because when entrepreneurs talk about being entrepreneurs, I always relate to a certain extent. And then there's a point where I don't. So some of, one of the words that you use is we're unemployable. And I feel that way. Like I weirdly, and it might surprise you because I've had so many jobs. I've worked in a lot of different fields and I've done really well at all of these jobs, but I've never felt employable myself. I'm always like, get me out of here. The second I have a boss that doesn't feel like a collaborator to me, I'm just itching to go. And that's, it's been painful. And I've taken it out on myself mentally at times because there, there were times I was in the final round of interviews for a job and I would have done really well at it and I didn't get it. And I was actually excited when Mm. I didn't get it. And I was like, it's like, I should, this is what I should be aspiring to, like getting the salary job. But I was always more excited that I didn't get it and tried to tell myself, like, maybe I'm just unemployable, yeah. but it just turns out I didn't want to work for anybody and I wanted to work on my terms. And that means a lot to me. But then when you talk about the risk and everything that entrepreneurs have, I don't have that thirst for risk. I just like to, I like to just co- collaborate more on a, person-to-person basis rather than work under the umbrella of a company or something. Well, that's interesting. So we, we talked about, I, I created that equilateral, I guess we call it mm-hmm. a triangle for an entrepreneur where we had a uh, drive, free will and risk for you. I think the free will definitely applies. Mm-hmm. Um, the risk, no. Mm-hmm. And then the drive part, Would it be drive or would it be purpose or would it be, there would be something else there. You probably have a triangle of your own. Yeah, that that would be an interesting thing to look at. It's people having triangles of their own with their own qualities. Right, their qualities. Right, because I, when you talk about, you, when you and Doug Brockman were talking about Drivens, I did not relate, but in a certain way I do because I don't have a boss and I've kept multiple projects going at the same time and always met my deadlines and always you know showed up where I was supposed to be and I'm I'm very regimented in that way so it's not to say that I don't feel an internal drive especially towards the end of a project and especially when I have accountability Mm. but I don't feel the like the navy seal the professional athlete like I'm someone who does not have motivation in that direction So, yeah, I wonder what the word would be for drive when it's like mostly around creativity. Yeah, there's got to be. That's probably your other angle was creativity, although entrepreneurs Mm. like that, but creativity is really important to you, too. If your challenge is you were poisoned with free will, you you got a taste just like Mm. B.B. Wolf salivated things. You got a taste of free will and you're like, yeah. I like Mm -hmm. that a lot. Mm -hmm. That worked for you. Right. And I think it's funny because my dad, I don't know if he would call himself an entrepreneur, but he definitely has some entrepreneurial drive and spirit. He's a small business owner, but I think I inherited the, like, I don't want to work for anybody else from him. And 
Independence. Independence, yeah. Maybe that's the word. I don't Yeah, know. I think independence is a good word. Yeah, for sure. So fable writing, have you done other fables? I haven't done fables exactly like this. I think it depends on how you look at fiction, but a lot of people will reduce fiction to like, there are three stories. There's man versus nature. There's man versus man. You know, that type of, in that way, almost everything that you write has the same trajectory that might not have the moral outcome. And I would say that in the type of fiction I write, you don't want, the author doesn't need to be asserting a moral outcome on their characters. You want, I particularly just want to tell a story that engages readers and not have them walk away like, hmm, I learned something. So that would be a difference between the fiction that I write in my own pursuit of the craft mm. and a fable. But it, it like at some point, there's a big overlap. I don't know if that answered your question. It does. It does. So I had such fun writing this. And so I just shared the Who Hunter. Yes right now, like chapter nine or so in the book. And what I had done with Who Hunter was I interviewed Dean Jackson, who is the original voice of Who Not How, um, which ended up turning into a book. Who knows if it's going to turn into a movie? Who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think I mentioned Mike Brady in that with, if you remember the, the Brady Bunch, where Mike Brady was an architect and in some future version of that show they showed mike brady doing models of everything and everything looked like their house with the wedge oh. this and that and so i was saying to, to to dean i said is every is this like your one thing is just you know the who not how and he laughed but we took that and we turned it into a story and we had pigville which i you know we we love that we came up with an earlier story based all starting with the three little pigs and then the wolf becomes good because Doug Brackman, who was one of the interviews, talked about the entrepreneur as a wolf. Mm -hmm. He had a story that ultimately was, we learn on an entrepreneurial journey not to bite the people who we depend on to help work the business, not to growl at them and show them a little love. And you get a lot better results as a, res as a result of that. But in the Who Hunter... I have zero experience with cats mm. and you brought in these cats and gave cats, you brought cats to life. And I loved that. How was that for you? Oh, I loved that. That was so much fun. We were trying to, to decide these characters who came in and they weren't the bad guys. There was a lot of anti-cat information out there. And I'm here to tell you it's all false. Cats are amazing, but cats are little stinkers. And, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want to employ cats. There's a reason why when you're trying to do something that's physically impossible, they call it herding cats. It's like herding cats because <laughs> you can't, they're too independent. So we brought in these cats who were rat hunters, but who weren't employable and maybe not because they were bad, just because they're cats. Um, and I think that's going to be a great illustration of who like finding your who because the cat had the qualities that you might need in the who they just weren't the who yeah and they were independent You're too independent mm -hmm. just like you <laughs> i would love to be a cat i'm trying to actually reincarnate as a parisian bookstore cat so you know how to make that happen <laughs> I think, be in, I think the Hindu culture, I'm not sure, but I don't know if that would be up or down as far as your type. Oh, it would be, in my opinion, yes. Opinion. That would be a major upgrade. There you go. That's funny. Yeah, you, you brought in such great illustration or illustrative words around, and and B.B. Wolf called an all-pause-on-deck meeting, and only one cat showed up, and and he was late. And I just love the, the, the playfulness that you brought to that chapter. Thank you. Well, that was really fun. And earlier when you were saying that this was fun, I absolutely agree. And I wanted to say another difference between this and the fiction that I typically write is that this was way more fun. Ah. I didn't, there was at no point in the process where I sat down thinking about this story or, you know, when we were outlining it that I thought, I don't want to do this. It was 
so much fun and so many times I sit down to write my own fiction and I am it was like pulling teeth Mm. but I think that's the way a lot of people feel about their art when they're actually in the process of doing it yeah I had a bunch of breakthroughs with you Mm. Um, one was you listened and then I I don't know if you ever studied like Disney's philosophy for management they're always plussing so Mm. like you go to the Disney haunted mansion and a year from now, they could have done just some minor tweak to one of the headstones out there. And that's to make the ride better. Mm-hmm. Right? So they're always plussing. And I found throughout our process, you were plussing things. Oh, and you were plussing things constantly. Well, I'd come back and look you. at the document. I mean, one of my favorite ones of the last round was that when the shopkeepers association whenever something like bad news is shared and they're all commiserating, they cheers and they say beers. And then the next yeah. time someone shares something good, they say cheers. And I, that was so clever. <laughs> I never would have thought of that. There you go. Yeah. Well, and selfish town and elfish town. I never, that could never have come out of my brain. So it oh, was, that a, was cool, right? Was yeah, that, that, was really that, cool. that actually happened? And then we ended up being out elf. I, I completely had a brain fart, so to speak of elf being easy lucrative and fun and it was the story that joe had told me about stone soup right oh i thought that's where you got that it is where i got it okay okay but i didn't realize it until i saw joe and he was like elf oh like elf town easy lucrative and fun i'm like oh my gosh and then we went to half yeah it's a beautiful easter egg too like a reference to him and these stories Something I loved about working on them is that they're self-referential. So some of the stories, you know, build on each other and they reference the interviews you did with people. So I just think that's so smart. I love it when things can be tidy like that. It kind of worked out well. So had you ever worked with uh, a podcast format where a person would have a podcast and the chapter and then you can kind of like weave it in? No, I hadn't. Uh, I have worked with authors who have podcasts and sometimes I would listen to the pos- their podcast to, you know, listen to their voice and just kind of get more of a feel of their personality and how they present information. And that just helped as I was working with them and helping them structure their book. But I had never brought in the, the ideas of a guest from a podcast. Mm. That was cool. So I loved it because you had already worked on the Who Not How chapter right? And we call it Who Hunter, right? Yes. And then you listen to the Dean Jackson interview. And I remember seeing, you, you shot me a text and you said, he's such a nice guy. And then you said, I have some new ideas about this. So you were having some innovations while you were listening mm-hmm. to what he was saying. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. He, he has just, all, all the people you interviewed were really nice. There was something about Dean. He has such a pleasant voice too. And having already worked on the who hunter story and had all the characters in place, you know, nobody was, he, he wasn't necessarily personified in that story because you hadn't even done the interview with him yet when we worked on that story. So it just going in reverse. Yeah. He just struck, he just struck me in a certain way. And I, I loved hearing his interview and, And I love that the book Who Not How is dedicated to him. Somehow, I guess that really fit together because I hadn't understood before that he had uttered the words Who Not How and then it really resonated with the Dan Sullivan who went and wrote the book. And I I had been trying to piece that together kind of in my own mind, just like, wait, whose book is this? Whose book is this? And then it came came out that it was... It was Ben Hardy who wrote the book for, oh, Dan, Sullivan, for Dan Sullivan, oh, who okay. explained Dean's concept, like right. talk about entrepreneurism. My God. Exactly. Well, and then that, then it all came together when, when Dean said that the book was dedicated to him. And somehow that felt so right with the way he presented on your podcast and just hearing him talk that he would be, you know, someone who said this and then someone else got so inspired and then took it to the next level, but dedicated it to him. And I think that's uh, really indicative too of how the entrepreneurial community works. And it is self-referential as well. Like everybody adopts each other's acronyms and builds on that. And that's just how the exponent works, right? Without a doubt. Yeah, Yeah. I think it's pretty cool. So I just had an idea. Okay. We name the owl Dean. Oh. And Dean 
makes one reference to even a cow doesn't milk himself, uh, milk herself. That's a really good idea. And that's a great way to pull in his interview. Right? Bam. See, there we go. This there we go. How ideas happen. It's just good stuff. It's just that's good really stuff. That's really good. And I like the, I, I like to say it's a multimedia experience. Mm. When, when you read one of my books, it's not just going to be flat. It's going to give you opportunity to hear a podcast as far as some of the innovations are concerned. And in this book, as I mentioned to you before, each fable, and I know it's the evil AI. My daughter is a, a scenic artist and AI is threatening artists, authors. Thank the Lord. I think the strike just ended today, which I, did, I just saw. Very, very grateful. Well, they don't know the details yet, but it's it's done. But I'm going to use AI for what AI was intended for. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our stories and then have it create some sort of animation around it so people could actually see it, mm -hmm. which I think is an applicable or a, 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 an appropriate application of AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm in my own mind, I'm, I'm not sure what the appropriate applications of AI are because I don't think I fully understand what AI can do. I feel yeah. very behind and I'll, all I know is that I tell people or all the time they find out I'm a writer and they're like oh well not for long <laughs> not in those words but in that sentiment and I want to say well I think it's a long time before AI can do what we did yeah you know it, it could have maybe given us the outline to these stories but it wouldn't be able to do what you just did and say oh well we'll have the owl be named dean and we're going to make it reference this thing he said in an interview that you did with him right yeah. i don't yeah. think it's there yet maybe in a few years but i don't i'll listen back to this in a few years and go wow i was wrong well so kira brinton who we both know from joan of arc publishing came up with a little bit of a seal Mm -hmm. right and you know how you get food that says no sugar added no this added and so on she has no ai added which i thought was brilliant mm. that is really brilliant you know if you think mm -hmm. about it because i resent getting emails from ai mm -hmm. and i can determine a lot of times i can determine that it's ai that's reaching out to me if i'm reading a book and it's written by ai I basically feel like it's drool. It's garbage. Well, interestingly, I had, and several of us who are in, we used to work together. And so we just continue to stay in contact with each other. We had someone approach us all separately with an, an AI written novel, mm. but they didn't tell us it was AI written. They said it was about AI and they offered us, they asked us for quotes to edit it and they wanted a ridiculously fast turnaround time on it. And so a few of us were kind of skeptical. One person actually saw the text and sent it back and said, it's word salad. I, I cannot edit this. And then found out that it was actually written by AI. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think that this is something that's around for a very long time. And when we talked about, I spent a lot of time on AI. It's got probably about a five year must see and understand and figure out how to use it. But the way it's been described for me is it's going to be utilized as a concierge of sorts, which right. is a lot better. It's like when people stop taking tolls for most toll booths. And now all of a sudden those people got jobs elsewhere, but they're not breathing in exhaust right. fumes any longer. There's no creativity to that making change all day, just not okay. Right. And it does make sense as a kind of better search engine that you could say to it i don't know what what was the political climate like in you know whatever year and it would just tell you you know it would kind of create this yeah. condensed information rather than you having to do hours and hours of reading exactly. you know that makes sense that's kind of like work smarter not harder yeah. <laughs> but not actually taking away the um, creative aspect of the job without a doubt and it's, again this has been a really fun project so and much fun. I believe your gift is fable writing I could tell 
from the moment we started talking that you were going to have fun with it. Mm -hmm. I love the demeanor by which you were non-judgmental on certain things. I mean, we're, we're from two different generations. And one of the things I appreciated about you was you were not judging at all. And at one point we had, there's some, some of these fables have some of my life stories in it. And one, one of my favorite was when the BB Wolf was driving some dogs, some female dogs to, to, was it, was it the prom or was it just the prom? Yeah. To the prom, just like in my life story. And I said, you know what? Uh, let's either call them pups or bitches. And I don't know if that's politically correct. And we were like, absolutely. And you wrote and bitches. And then you wrote in col- in parentheses, what did you say? Come on, they're dogs. I, I said literal bitches. Come on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and that's, that-, that is the one and only application that I think is politically correct. But it's a joke. I think, you know, and we were keeping your your ideal reader in mind. And I don't think your ideal reader is going to read into that other than like, well, that's actually the one and only literal application that we can use this word. So I thought yeah, it was but, funny. Yeah, well, thank you. And and you thought a bunch of other things were funny. And I was, um, and I appreciated that because you act as a barometer mm-hmm. for the readers as well. Right. Well, and if you, you know, just for for it to be said, you're not the type of person who would try to say something like heinous. But if my author did try to say something heinous, I would talk, I would talk them out of it. I just mm-hmm. didn't think that that literal application was heinous in any way. And if someone is offended by it, I I am sorry to them. Yeah, well, it's, I, it's, I think you can offend everybody. You it's, can offend anybody. Anybody, and, you know. but I, I can't live my life that way and that's why you know the title of the book right now in its beta is welcome to entrepreneur once upon a time in entrepreneur land a series of entrepreneurially positive fables yes i think that's a great title i i like it and then if we do our dosa dough i guess they say however you say it in french i think that that is where the we get the word dosido because it's when you turn your backs to each other dancing, but do in French is back. And so it'd be dos a do in, in French. Hey, my French major came up just now. There you go. It came yeah, up a couple so. of times, L-O-D and yeah. Yeah. And a couple of times, right? It is. I mean, French and English have about 30% of the same vocabulary. So just sounds a lot nicer yeah. than the language. For it sure. sounds, it sure does sound nice. Especially when you're trying to discipline somebody or make or shame them. They've got that little at the end of their words and such. So, yeah. so, so I had kind of toyed with you creating this exponential company called Fable Makers. And if, if that were to come to be a reality, I want no credit, but I do want to know, would you be interested in working with other entrepreneurs that are looking to take either existing books or future works of art that they're looking to create, that they're an authority in and create fables for other people to be able to have memorable stories? That sounds like so much fun. And like I said, that was one of my favorite things about working on this book is that we had the you know, you get to decide what the moral of the story is and then write to it. And that's very satisfying in a way that like writing literary fiction is not. But why you you feel like you want to share this idea with everybody? That's very generous of you. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, that was part of the point of this interview was people to understand the genesis mm. of this work of art, which I got to be honest, a lot of parents want their kids to become entrepreneurs. And when I was a kid, entrepreneurs were the people who couldn't work for anybody else and typically didn't make any money and typically were losers or just did not want to, did not want to take a job from anybody. My my dad wanted me to work for the government or a teaching job or a police or whatever, just to be able to have that pension and all that other stuff. Well, I fooled them all Mm -hmm. and I did what I did and he was supportive towards the end probably the end 20 years, I'd say, but in the beginning you're struggling. Right. And that's, that's just what ends up happening. Mm -hmm. Another breakthrough that I don't know if you'd offer this to other people, but it was so helpful to me was, so it was fable. And then it was take, take, take home 
qualities, like different points that we put afterwards. What do we call those? Oh, the takeaways. Takeaways. Sorry, I'm using my words. But what was helpful to me when I was first reading them, I am so critical. I couldn't read a story without editing the shit out of it. It was so painful for me. Mm. And I said to you, okay, I don't need you to read the whole book, but could you do me a favor and just read the fable? And that was awesome mm. because mm -hmm. it helped me get the true essence of it because you had inflection on certain words and the way you said it. And so I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I think that kind of also gives you one level of remove instead of being like, these are my words. I hate them all. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. To, to hear someone else speaking, it just lets you see it almost how like you'll be critical of your own face in the mirror, whereas someone else doesn't even notice whatever you're focusing on or something. That level of remove is really helpful. And in my program, they told us when you're about to read your work for the another time, print it out in a different font. And it still just like somehow gives you your eye just like a tiny bit of remove helps you notice what you do want to change, but it also just changes it physically for you. So you're not just fixated on it in a way that you can experience it from a, a more new standpoint, if that makes sense. It was a game changer for me. Good. And because I think I... that these are going to be beautiful recorded. And, you know, we were talking about you having some of your friends read them. And I think that would go great. Okay. Heck yeah. Well, we'll see how that goes. But I know your reading of the fables was a huge breakthrough for me because I could, I could try to explain it to somebody. I say, no, just listen to this. Mm -hmm. Like, oh wow, that's that's awesome. Wow, so different, so unique. So I believe that entrepreneurs will get a huge opportunity to be able to tell their content through fable. Mm -hmm. And you know, I give you absolutely, you know, 10 stars, if that's a possibility, as, you know, an amazing partner in writing my book and creating stories that are so meaningful. Thank you so much for all the effort and joy that you put into it. You made this a fun process. Oh, thank you. You made it a fun process too. And as all book coaches say, but I'll reiterate again, like, I literally could not and would not have done it without you. So you get absolute full credit for all of these stories and all of the, the wonderful morals behind them. And I feel like a conduit on your journey to bring you're my channeler. You're world. my, you're, you're my fable channeler. That's absolutely how I feel. I feel like a conduit, you know, you have all the water, but we're just channeling it to the place it needs to go. And and then the little collaborative details that come along the way, like all pause on deck. That's just the sprinkles on top. That's the I fun that. created, you know, if you told me 10 years ago that I was going to have a job where I was getting to write things like they had an all pause on deck meeting and that it would fit and people would be excited about it. I would, that's just such a dream to be able to use fun, like tongue in cheek creativity to actually get a big point across. Mm. Yeah, really fun. And and also I wanted to say thank you for saying that I was non-judgmental because that's the number one quality I want to bring to my interactions with authors I work with because it's actually going to be on my website, but I need a who for my website right now because it's in absolute peril because I tried to do it myself. But I'm going to I have a, a part of it that says you know, when you're writing a book even if it's not a memoir, it's a really vulnerable process. And if the author ever feels judged and feels uh, scrutinized in a bad way, it, the process is going to go badly. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be cathartic or rewarding. And if you think about if you've ever gone to the doctor and like felt embarrassed by whatever's happening on your body, if it's like a mole or something and you're embarrassed and that's a terrible way to feel at the doctor. Yeah. And you don't want to feel that embarrassment telling your story either, because it's just as intimate. So that's my, I, when I taught my class the other day, I, that was the thing I was like, your, let's call it bedside manner, actually matters a lot more than your resume even. Can you 
show up in the space and make it happen, you know, in a, in a way that feels good for everyone. So I'm going to wrap up with this. You learned a new phrase that I use, which is going in the luge. I love the luge. Right. Where you're intensely focused and you can't stop when you're on the luge. Mm -hmm. You just got to keep going. And you and I came up with unrealistic timetables to do this, which normally I think we were like three weeks in and you said, this is usually three months Yeah. in my experience. So now that you've gotten to experience both processes, which do you like better, the luge or just, you know, cross-country skiing, which sounds like the most boring thing in the world because I've seen people... Cross country skiing, what is it, snowshoeing or so? Both look know. really boring to me. You I'm know, from Alabama. <laughs> yeah, they got these two things. So pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I think so. it depends on the project, but I very much enjoyed the luge. And something I learned from the luge is it actually saves you a lot of time in retrospect because if you're spacing out your calls by a week, it's it's hard for you, the book coach or the author to remember what they talked about last time, even if you like send a good recap email or whatever, and, and they'll tell the same story again. And then the next day when you're going through the transcript, you're like, oh, I got, how did I, ma- I manage to get that content twice? But if they did the call yesterday or 48 hours ago, they're much more on top of what they've already said. Yeah. And that's really cool. I can't believe how much ground we covered in the time that we covered it. And that's, you've also taught me the the term big, hairy, audacious goal. BHAG, yes. Which is like, and I love that. I have already, I've always loved the BHAG. I just didn't have a word for it. We just tried. We didn't get bent out of shape when we had to add another week to it because the project needed another week. And that's what happens. You have to do things in service of the project. Yeah. So that was very cool. Yeah. So would you be willing to do projects like that for anybody that would be interested, like doing a fable and then intensely focusing on it for a short period of time rather than, I think it took me close to two years to do pitchology, which was ridiculous. I never mm-hmm. imagined it taking that long. That was painful. The the link, the lengthy projects really can be painful. And that's more of the timeline that I'm used to is a year of writing and then the the publication takes six seven eight months on the other side of it you know choosing the cover and all of that I would be willing to do it as fast as anybody needs to do it it's I actually really enjoy the intense focus and then getting to the satisfaction of closing it and saying it's done and that's really I mean I've been working on my novel for almost eight years Mm. so (laughs) to finish somebody else's book with them and get to see the pleasure um, by proxy, I guess, of them holding their book in their hands, like that's scratching the itch that I don't know if I'll, I'm too much of a perfectionist to even start querying my novel. Um, yeah, it kind of, just becomes, another, yeah, it becomes an existence, um, yeah. like, like a bloodletting, but like with very little blood coming out over time, and you're just exhausted at the end of the process and you don't get to pay attention to it. And this one really moved along very nicely for me. I think not, having not known what your undergrad was in and now learning to, that it was to be a director, it makes mm-hmm. complete sense because a director, I, I do documentary films, yeah. a director takes guidance, right, from the writer and then puts that in place and then creates the film, Right. And that's yeah. what you're doing. You're you're more of a fable director, mm-hmm. uh, you know, instead of a fable ma- maker, you're going to direct that next mm-hmm. v- vision of a person's uh, book. So I, I mean, to be honest cool. with you, I don't let everybody know that that is a lot of times I say my only undergrad is in French because I feel like people are going to think of me as, you know, a theater kid. And when I found out your daughter was in theater, I was like, excellent. <laughs> my son's a theater kid yeah. too. My son theater, and I mean, you know, and if you have the wrong idea of theater people, you know, the wrong idea of theater people. And I don't want people to think that about me. Or I mean, then I also don't tell people right off the bat that I'm from Alabama for the mm. same reason. I don't want them to think 
you know, insert your, you know, existing stereotypes about Alabamians, but when, when the time comes and, and, or I understand that they know what it actually takes to put on a theatrical production, which is an amazing amount of effort and intellect, I will say, yeah, I'm a theater major from Alabama. So for me, it was very relevant because it taught me it showed me where you got your project management skills from. Mm -hmm. Actually, a lot of the people that I know who are book coaches and ghostwriters are theater people. There you go. Because it is project management and it's creative project management and the creativity spans multiple fields. So Mm. it makes a lot of sense when you look at it like that. So again, I always connect the dots because I told you I I love to do these clarity blueprinting sessions. Mm -hmm. It sounds like some of the people who were just on strike could actually morph into being writers for others as well. And Mm -hmm. maybe they're just going to the wrong watering hole or the wrong room like they do in Who Moved My Cheese. Mm. They're going to the same place. They're going to Disney, Disney, Disney. And meanwhile, they should be going to entrepreneurs or whomever to be able to mm-hmm. take their stories and turn them into fables or stories that need to be written or so. Mm-hmm. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah, well, it is. Well, I'm excited. I can't wait for the book to come out. I am, uh, you know, in such gratitude for you and your gifts and talents and the joy when we get, you know, you'd be saying, I'll be up at five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning. I was like, does she ever sleep? And then you're like, no, I can't wait to get up to do this work. No, I am excited. It, it's true. I get so excited when I'm in the in this stage of a project because it's so satisfying to see it across the finish line. It's a satisfaction I don't think I would have I would feel if I didn't work as an independent contractor or freelancer, however you want to put it here, but I'm not working for somebody as a in a company. I'm I am you and I are the sole people here responsible for this project. And that feels great. Awesome. Well, yeah. Whatever I'm, it is about it, it's working for me. It's working. And I just want to share that with my fellow collaborators and friends and authors and entrepreneurs that this has been a great experience for me. Oh, it's um, wonderful. Me too. And I hope that um, seeing behind the scenes a little bit is fun for them. Absolutely. I think it will be. It'll be valuable. And so Leslie Hinson of Fable Makers, are we going to call you or are we going to call you something else? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think that could work. uh, I'll need someone to build my website. That's it. And I would hope that AI could go out, find books that can be Mm -hmm. chopped into chunks for memorable fables and then solicit people. That's when you're using AI as your bitch. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> oh la la oh la la i can't believe hey. you said it <laughs> yeah 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 well that was the application so yeah and that was it, a good it, application it, of oh la la because um fun fact the french don't usually say it for like oh how scandalous they say it like oh i can't believe that just happened yeah exactly <laughs> yeah well, thank you so much it was great chatting with you today and you hopefully- too everybody will get a chance to see all these great stories we're talking about very very soon so thank you leslie Thank you so much. Great idea with this book. Thank you for listening to the Entrepreneur Land podcast powered by Pitchology. For more information, additional episodes, and content, visit pitchology.ai, where you can also pick up a copy of my newest book, Once Upon a Time in Entrepreneur Land.